We are just grateful to have these wonderful folks. Unfortunately, Clay Wirestone, uh, opinion editor for the Kansas Reflector, is unable to make it due to uh, a COVID diagnosis. So we want to be in prayer for Clay for a full recovery, but certainly grateful for uh, Aaron and Michael to be here. And I'm gonna run upstairs for a new member orientation, which is exciting as well. But I'm gonna just hand the mic over to Julia, or who's done just invaluable work in getting all these um, items regarding election 2024 put together. So um, let's give a warm round of applause for our panel and for Julia. Thank you and welcome everyone. So glad you uh, took time out of your day to come to this presentation. It's going to be um, very informative for you, I know. Uh, I am a member of Church and Society and I am also uh, on the Asbury uh, Ambassador Program. Um, we still have opportunities if anyone would like to join that <laughs> since we have just what, I guess, one day less than a month before the election. Uh, our panel today is Aaron Thompson, who is General Counsel for Planned Parenthood for the Great Plains area, and then Michael Popa, who is Executive Director of Mainstream Coalition and has been since uh, 2020. Okay, and Erin has been with Planned Parenthood in her current position since, uh, what, last three and a half years? Erin, is that correct? Okay, our topic today, I'm sure as you know, is Christian nationalism and, um, well, Project 2025 and Christian nationalism, the effect that these two things have on public policy. I have asked our panel to zero, and we, they could talk about several topics, as I'm sure you all know. I've asked them to zero in on a couple of topics in particular, and that's public education and reproductive rights, which I think are of particular interest from everything I read uh, to, to Kansans. So they are going to give us uh, an overview of uh, Project 2025 and Christian nationalism, an overview of that relating to those two particular issues. I originally put out that there would be a 30 to 35 min minute presentation, but at their request, they would rather do maybe a broader overview and then give you the audience more time for your questions. So that's how we will uh, proceed this morning. And I think I'm done. And I'm gonna turn I'm gonna turn this over to our panel, which is what you came to hear. Thank you. Hi. Uh, Julia, uh, thank you so much uh, to you and the group for inviting us here today. Uh, it, it means a lot, and uh, we, I know that I'm very happy to be here, and I, I know Aaron is as well. Uh, as mentioned, unfortunately, Clay has COVID, but we do thank him for being um, that type of person who stayed home and did not show up. <laughs> um, I was mainly here for comedic relief, so I'm gonna really rely on Aaron <laughs> since Clay is not here. And there are several people in the audience that I know uh, know a lot about this. Both Aaron and I also uh, have served or do serve in local government, and so we can talk about some effects in local government as well. And I know that I can call on a few people out there too. Um, so. As Julia mentioned, uh, we are going to dive in with just kind of an overview of Project 2025, talk a little bit about uh, how that would affect uh, reproductive rights and public education in Kansas, and then we want to open it up for you all to ask questions, because I'm sure there are a lot of questions, because there is a lot um, in Project 2025. Uh, but first, I have a question for you. Would you say, raise your hand. Who, who knows a lot about 2025, Project 2025? Who thinks they could get up here with us? <laughs> I saw, I saw really all the hands go down. <laughs> I was hoping at least one person, right? Um, okay, so who thinks 
or who does know a lot? You, you've been reading about it. You've kind of been researching it. You understand some implications. Let's see those hands. All right, good. I would say about at least a third of you. Who has heard of Project 2025? All right, almost everybody. And then who is it, who out there, is this your first time even hearing about Project 2025? Okay. To Topher. <laughs> Topher has his headphones in, right? <laughs> oh, Aaron's son, Topher. Um, okay, so good. So everyone has at least heard about Project 2025. Um, or or knows, knows someone who has mentioned 2025 or said the words Project 2025. Uh, so... It is a uber conservative plan from a few very radical um, organizations out there. Um, the primary one being uh, the Heritage Foundation. Other organizations include uh, Moms for Liberty and um, the Family Policy Alliance. Uh, some of these groups, there are about 30, 30 of these groups, over 30 groups, that have put this document together. Um, it is a blueprint uh, outlining the steps needed to dismantle our current form of government. Uh, what it does is it, it fills in key federal positions uh, with ideologically and politically motivated and aligned individuals and implements policies that reflect a very narrow radical religious worldview. You'll hear us talk a little bit about Christian nationalism, and I know that uh, Julia brought that up as well. That plays a big part in 2025. And, and right, off, right up front, I want to say, Christian nationalism does not equal Christianity. I think everyone here in this room knows that. Aaron, Aaron and I definitely know that. And so I, I wanted to make sure that we were all starting from the same place. Christian nationalism does not equal Christianity at all. Um, what it aims to do, and this is kind of that brief overview, is um, it represents like that comprehensive effort I was talking about to consolidate that conservative, extreme conservative power within the executive branch and basically what some people have said create a, a theocracy instead of the democracy that we have now being ruled by one very narrow, extreme religious worldview. I talked about Christian nationalism, and that, uh, that plays a big part in 2025. It's what fuels Project 2025. Um, it's a movement in and of itself, and it merges the Christian identity with the American national identity. Uh, they advocate for the U.S. to be governed by that very narrow interpretation of biblical principles that I talked about and it co-ops religious beliefs for political purposes. Um, basically what it does, is it blends patriotism with religious fundamentalism, and that's what we find in almost every single page of Project 2025. Um, political goals would be that policies should align with the, the very narrow interpretations of, of biblical teachings that they've set out, and that includes opposition to reproductive rights, contraception, LGBTQ equality, diversity, equity, inclusion, secularism, public education, and so on and so forth. What, what are called, you know, the safety net programs that we have set up through the federal government. <clears throat> it touches on a lot. And uh, it would be pretty detrimental to our democracy, to, I believe, everyone in this room. It would touch in some fashion. Um, and it would impact negatively and very greatly. With that very brief overview, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Aaron to talk about one of the uh, issues and one of the topics that Project 2025 uh, would negatively impact. Thank you, Michael. And I just wanted you to also add to our introductions that I have been a lifelong Methodist and currently attend, um, yeah, you forgot, that's all right, currently attend Old Mission and uh, Michael also attends Church of the Resurrection. So we come, I think, from similar frame framing as, as you all. So I um, am really the content expert on reproductive rights. I don't know that I know a great deal about Project 2025 beyond that because I 
for work have to keep a narrow scope, it, scope because there's plenty of going on in the reproductive rights space. And when we talk about Project 2025, I think you all understand that this is not as guessing at what they think or what they believe their plan to be. This is a plan that is written out and it's published and you can go read it if you go to project2025.com, I think is where you can find it. And this is a blue, the written out blueprint of how to accomplish their narrow view of what they believe a, that the United States should be a Christian nation in their narrow set of beliefs. And when it comes to reproductive rights, they talk a lot about the sanctity of life. I'll put that in quotes because it doesn't take into account the pregnant person's life necessarily. And that life begins at conception. So there are several areas where they really um, lay out details on that. And I think in, you all know in Kansas, we have the right to abortion under the Kansas Constitution. In 2019, the Kansas Supreme Court found in a case that we have that right to bodily autonomy, which includes the right to terminate your pregnancy. And so the Kansas legislature didn't like that. They tried to put an amendment before the voters that would take away that right. And you all probably remember that was defeated by nearly 20, vote, 20 points. <coughs> So Kansans value the right to choose, they value the right to control their bodies, and have that right currently. So under Project 2025, there, they name many ways that they could attack that. The first is they would enforce Comstock. So what is Comstock? Well, it is an 1870s law, so like 10 years after the Civil War, this law was written. It's primarily focused, been used to prosecute people for obscenity, but it also makes it illegal to mail anything that could cause an abortion. <coughs> so as I said, this law has been on the books for more than 150 years, and it has never been used to prosecute a legal abortion, a legal abortion, I didn't say that very clearly. So there's case law back to 110 years that says it is only to be used to prosecute illegal abortions. There's a 1915 case, super old case, where a judge said that a, a, a doctor has the right to advertise abortion, life-saving abortions, and that so that Comstock doesn't apply to that. So that is how that law has always been interpreted. It's been amended since then and never been clarified. And so when a law has been amended after courts have interpreted it, it's, it's presumed to include that interpretation. <laughs> but in Project 2025, they say the Department of Justice should start prosecuting Comstock. And so that would make it illegal to mail anything that would cause an abortion. This would primarily target uh, medication abortion, but it could make abortion illegal federally in Kansas. So that would take away the right that we voted for and that we say that we support. <coughs> so that's the, one of the main, main things in there. It also, the Biden administration, after Dobbs issued a ruling, issued a, a guidance that EMTALA, which is the Emergency Medical Treatment and, and Active Labor Act, should be um, read to include abortion care. So if a patient presents at the ER and what will save their life is providing an abortion, you have to provide that abortion. Even if you're in Texas or Idaho, even, those, uh, even though those attorney generals say you don't, the federal government right now says you have to provide that abortion. So Project 2025 says you don't have to. We, they should not be providing abortion care. So if you show up at the hospital, you need an abortion to save your life, tough luck, you don't get it, because the doctor may not believe in abortion, and so that is when, why I say sanctity of life, in quotes. Um, the other couple of other things, right now there's a HIPAA privacy rule that the Biden administration did, where if, as a provider of legal abortions, if you get a subpoena from a state, so if, at, if we get a subpoena from a law enforcement in Oklahoma or Texas, I can send them an attestation and they have to swear that they're not gonna use it to prosecute the abortion provider or the person who got the abortion. So Project 2025 wants that taken away so that they can open the doors to prosecute abortion providers and people getting abortions. Um, it would prohibit abortion travel funding. We have guidance right now from the Biden administration that you have the constitutional right to travel. You can travel and get an abortion. You can provide funding to travel and get an abortion. That's constitutionally protected. Project 2025 says we should take that away and you cannot travel. You can't provide funding for people to travel to get an abortion. 
Um, there's the Title X funding, which is funding for um, family planning. And many Planned Parenthoods, many abortion providers get this funding and for their family planning provisions. They would take that away um, from, from Planned Parenthoods and other abortion providers and reinstate the gag rule, which has been in effect. It fl flip-flops. If there's a re Republican administration, the gag rule goes into effect. If there's a Democratic, it goes away. So the gag rule says you have to keep a separation between the abortion providing um, entity and the family planning entity. So you can't refer people to abortions if they find out they're pregnant. You can't tell them about abortion. You can't refer them to an abortion. Um, they would also remove um, morning after pill because they think that once, once uh, there's fertilization, then you shouldn't have any options. And some, um, some of the morning after pills and some other contraceptions uh, don't allow implantation after fertilization. And so that under Project 2025, they view those as against the sanctity of life. So those would no longer be available either. So that's a quick overview. There's a lot more in there, but those are the kind of the big, um, big picture reproductive rights targets in Project 2025. Thanks, Aaron. And I'll go over some of those big buckets in public education, as Aaron did with uh, uh, reproductive rights. Uh, many of you may have heard, uh, should Project 2025 go into effect, they would gut and close the Department of Education. In fact, they would, they would gut uh, many different uh, federal agencies um, and replace the people there if they kept the agency with um, adherence to their teachings, adherence to that really small, uh, narrow biblical worldview and political leanings. Um, by closing the Department of Education, by eliminating that, they eliminate federal funding for public education. That eliminates oversight and curriculum oversight in public education. Um, it leads to content censorship. So these are things that are actually mentioned in the document, the 900 some odd pages document. Uh, so if you do go out to project2025.com and read it, um, have a couple days. <laughs> have a couple days. Um, content censorship in schools. So deciding what any child, any student should be reading, should be discussing, should be you know, having a conversation about, should be hearing about in schools, specifically um, censorship uh, for removing any discussions of LGBTQ plus topics from public schools. It would include censoring books, like I said, discussions, curricula uh, that discuss anything related to equality, uh, anything related to teaching the truth. Uh, we've already seen book bans go into effect. Um, there, are, there is a list of books out there that have been banned in different school districts across the United States. Um, I, I don't have a website, but you can Google that and you can see what To Kill a Mockingbird is one of those books. That is one of my favorite books growing up. In fact, I just watched that movie um, last month with my husband because uh, he had never seen it. So I'm like, what? <laughs> um, so we watched To Kill a Mockingbird. I can't believe that that, that movie is on there. Um, other curriculum changes uh, would be a more conservative approach to teaching history and civics, as I mentioned. So many of you are familiar with Teach the Truth. It gives different perspectives on history and not just a Western civilization white uh, perspective on history and how it happened, because we all know Whoever wins is the one that writes a story. And that's all I was taught in school. And now they're starting to teach a more, a more broad um, view, a more real, a truthful view of history. And this is something that would change, that would be cut out of public curricula under Project 2025. Expands the uh, parent or parental control in education. So that could empower parents to challenge curricula and books whenever they deem fit. Right now, a parent can say, that is not right for my child. That's not right for my student. And this is what they can do now, and they have every right to do this. I'd rather they not learn about this or be part of that discussion. And they pull them, unfortunately, for the student, they pull them from that discussion. What they intend to do 
with Project 2025 is allow any parent on any subject that they deem is not applicable or they deem is you know, unworthy of their status or they deem would be detrimental for some reason to their, their uh, child, their student, they could challenge that. They could have it pulled, not just for, not pull their kid out, but pull that book, pull that topic out of the curricula, out of the library, out of the conversation completely for every student. Um, it would ridiculously expand the voucher program, which you may have heard as school choice. And that's, you know, very, uh, it's, it's something that mainstream has been fighting in Kansas for as long as I can remember. I know every year in the Kansas legislature, some new form of voucher expansion of uh, what they sometimes call scholarships, uh, school choice scholarships pops up in the legislature. And for, for those of you who may not be completely familiar with that, what that does is it takes public funding, it takes our tax dollars, and it funnels it away from public education into private and a lot of times religious institutions. So the public funds are now supporting religious institutions that don't have to adhere to the same, and, and private institutions that don't have to adhere to the same guidelines, to the same criteria, to the same certifications, and to the same non-discrimination guidelines as public education does. It takes a certain uh, amount of money that could be allotted to any student uh, that any parent would like to take their child out of public school and, and instead put them in private school. Well, that small amount of money that um, the parent will get does not cover tuition, first of all, for a private school. And we've seen that many of those children, many of the students that go from public school to private school on one of these so-called scholarships, uh, on the voucher, they're often back in public school because they, they could not sustain that level of t tuition over the years. But while that student is in private school, in that private institution, the public school is not receiving those public funds and we're subsidizing private institutions. Religion in school, so Mainstream was founded over 30 years ago now on the basis of uh, protecting church-state separation. There should not be one religion that all of us have to bow to. Everyone has freedom of religion. You have the freedom to worship as you choose. We have the freedom now to come into this Methodist church, to be with our church community, and to worship as we choose. Well, Project 2025, it mandates, doesn't say it specifically, but it would mandate a national religion. And that would be that very narrow worldview of Christianity, that extreme worldview of Christianity, that extreme biblical view that I spoke of earlier. It would be in every facet of our society, including our government and public education. It does talk about uh, religion in schools, specifically about prayer in school and a greater integration of those religious components um, in areas where faith-based initiatives overlap with education. Right now they are still separate, but that would not be the same, that would not be the case should Project 2025 um, be instated. I think that's a pretty good general overview of public education. Uh, Aaron, did you have anything to add on that? No. Okay, just like I have nothing to add on reproductive rights. Um, actually, you know what? Let me, let me do this really quickly. Uh, so I do have kind of a fact sheet here uh, of how Project 2025 would specifically negatively impact Kansas and Kansans, and hopefully I have this stat right when it comes to reproduction, uh, reproductive rights. So for reproductive rights, um, it would ban free emergency contraception for 449,000 women around that. Um, is what uh, the data that I got is telling me. There would be a tax increase of about two, about 3,000, 276, uh, 200, $2,760 per year for a typical family of four. 
Project 2025 would see social security cuts for 74% of retirement age Kansans by pushing back the retirement age. And up to, and those um, beneficiaries over 10 years would see a reduction in benefits of up to $100,000. And that's not $100,000 total, that's $100,000 per beneficiary over the first 10 years. That's a lot of money, especially considering inflation. You know what a dollar is going to be worth in five years, in ten years. It doesn't account for any of that. Uh, higher prescription costs, of course, for up to 130,000 Medicare recipients. Uh, it would also ban uh, in Kansas for those same recipients any kind of negotiation, any kind of uh, Medicare negotiation with drug companies for lower costs. Um, it would end no-cost child care. So by ending and dismantling the uh, Department of Education that would get rid of any of those Head Start programs. And right now, those Head Start programs um, and that no-cost childcare um, and other services serves 7,200 low-income children and families in Kansas right now. They would lose that opportunity for quality, low-cost, or no-cost childcare and um, other services. So Head Start teaches uh, adults, teaches parents how to um, manage their budget. Like there are, there are other things that Head Start does, not just childcare. Um, and then it would eliminate 1,450 teaching positions in Kansas. And uh, those positions, those teachers serve 18, almost 19,000 public school students. So you can imagine the closings of public school, especially in rural areas, that would happen. The condensing of children from two or three classrooms to one classroom. So quality of public education would be lowered significantly. You know, add that to the decreased funding or no funding from the federal government, the decreased public funding from Kansans through tax dollars, because those are being funneled now to private education, and you have effectively dismantled and closed public education, or banned access to quality, no cost public education. So, Aaron, did you have anything? Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, so we lied, and we were going to take 35 minutes for our presentation. <laughs> well, I guess we did. <laughs> Julia was right. We were wrong. We should have listened. We said, well, Clay's not here. We probably won't take that long up front. We did. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you very much for all of the information. Now we will open it up to your questions. If you will... Um, uh, Ask your question, maybe speak as loudly as you can, and then the panel is going to repeat it so that all of us can hear. Yes, what, what's the driving force behind this? Is, what's, what's pushing this so hard? Is it the Christian people, or is it a, a libertarian uh, heritage foundation? What's, what's driving this? Why, why is this so important? to so few people. So the question is, what's pushing this? Why is this so important? Why is it getting the traction I think it's getting? And who's pushing it? Michael, do you want to take it? <laughs> sure, I can take, I can take some of that. I, I mean, I'm happy to. We talked about, yeah. yeah, we talked about that earlier. But um, it, it is basically being pushed, as I think you were alluding to, by a small percentage of people with privilege to retain that privilege and to gain more power. And I, what I didn't mention up front is that Project 2025 is just the most recent iteration of what the Heritage Foundation calls Mandate for Leadership. So it's a presidential transition project, is what they call it, for very extremely, you know, extreme conservative um, presidents. And it outlines the different ways that they can they can install their people, their adherents, their policies. This is the most recent, as I said, Project 2025 is what it's called, and it's the most dangerous that we've seen so far. Um, and it, it really just goes back to people who have power want to control that power. 
they want to, or, I'm sorry, they want to retain that power. They want to retain control. And, and, and Aaron, we, Aaron, we talked about control earlier. Did you want to add? Well, um, you asked, is it Christianity? Change, change track a little bit. You asked if it was Christianity or Christians who are pushing this. And I, I would say no. I think Christianity is used, being used as a vehicle, being used to pr propagate this and to get it further. And, it, you, you know, I don't, I, in our affiliate at Planned Parenthood Great Plains, we have Kansas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Missouri. And I don't think it's a coincidence that our one state that has access is Kansas that came into the union as a free state. And we value controlling your own body. And other, and all, I love all of our states equally, so I will stop that train of thought. But I do think there is a <laughs> history in our country of controlling other people's bodies and owning other people. And this is a push to, return to that and to have control over those bodies and have a, a, a small percentage of people retain that power and expand the power that they, they view as slipping away. Yeah, I, I do want to reiterate what Aaron said, and thank you for picking the second part of that question up. I, I, I appreciate it. Uh, the, the Christians, as maybe we know them, are not pushing this. It is a vehicle. Christianity is a vehicle, and it's a distorted view of Christianity uh, at that. Um, but it is about power, and th the thing is, should these policies take effect, should this blueprint be carried out and built, it's not something that changes with the next change of guard. This impacts us for years and years and years and years into the future. What's the benefit to that small percentage of people, very wealthy, whatever, what's the benefit to them? What's the benefit to the small people who will contain, they will retain their wealth and build on their wealth. And they are convincing people without that wealth that it will be beneficial to them when it will not be. But the small percentage of people will retain control and build and expand their wealth. And keep the voters stupid. Correct, yeah. Linda? Is there a legislative pathway after that gets enacted? either from the education, like educational changes to the Supreme Court or a legislative pathway to stop it for Kansas. Can somebody in Kansas or any other state initiate something that will stop that? You want to talk about SCOTUS? Yeah, yeah. so the question is, is there anything that can be done legislatively to stop it? And so a lot of this would be um, federal, federal rules, federal power, and there is a supremacy clause that says federal law is supreme. And so it's, it's a, it's kind of makes my head spin and explode a little bit because generally the states can give you more rights than the federal government. You can't give fewer rights than the federal government. But we've never really had a a time in our country where the federal government dictated to states that they had to take away rights. And that's what would happen here, um, especially women's rights and reproductive rights. They would be telling states they have to take that away. And so obviously we, everybody would litigate and challenge these. And um, because it's federal, the ultimate decider would be the United States Supreme Court. And unfortunately, the Heritage Foundation has been working on the Supreme Court for years and years and years. And we saw that with the Dobbs decision. We saw it with the, um, so many decisions. The, there was bad environmental law that was made this last session. And so it's, it, we need to stop it at the election and not get in this dire place. Rick? <clears throat> yeah, this goes to the sanctity of a life comment that she made, Karen. Can you talk a little bit about, it seems to be the irony of the fact that the right wants to protect against abortion, but doesn't really seem to be very interested in helping once a child is born? Yeah, that, that's a good, good comment about the sanctity of life, and the right seems to want to help, um, but not help after the child's born. And I would say they also don't particularly care to help the person who is pregnant before the child's born. I think we've seen tragic cases out of Georgia lately where women have died because they couldn't get the necessary abortion care that they needed. And so it's, I don't put much credence in the sanctity of life. I think that's some propaganda that they've 
some marketing propaganda that they've, they've used and come up with. But also, if you really had cared about the sanctity of life, of course, you would be making sure that children have health care and education and that parents could afford to work and send their kids to, to daycare and could afford all of those things. So I, I don't see much credence to their sanctity of life position. Leon. This is not so much a question, but it seems to me that this Christian nationalism is very similar to what we hear about in the news, the, the, the countries that are ruled by Sharia law in yeah. the Muslim world. Yeah. It's very similar to me. Yeah. Is, that, is that a reasonable correlation? That is a reasonable co correlation, and the, 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 the comment or the question was, so Christian nationalism seems to uh, be parallel or very similar to countries that are ruled by Sharia law. Uh, would that be, and the question then to that, would would that be a, a, a good comparison? Yes. So you have one religion, a national religion. You have that religion, a narrow uh, biblical interpretation then being carried out in all of the policies and procedures and departments and agencies from federal government all the way down to your local governments. Because as Aaron um, mentioned earlier, we do have the supremacy clause and federal government does reign supreme. Most of these actions, when it's consolidated into the presidency, when it's consolidated into the executive branch, all of the power and control, uh, if that happens in Project 2025, a lot of this is gonna be done by executive order. As I mentioned earlier, it's not going to be easy just to overturn it or to issue another executive order, but this could pertain to anything because it is executive order. And even if there was a legislative uh, avenue or vehicle, there's a lot that executive order touches um, that wouldn't necessarily uh, impact any kind of legislative decision. Does that answer the question? I want to make sure. Okay. Thank you. Comment and question. The comment is, wouldn't it be possible to split these into two issues and the abortion issue is here and Christian nationalism is over here? But, but a broader question is, you know, Paul Revere went around warning the people of an imminent danger. Am, am I hearing that you're suggesting this is an imminent danger? You're sort of like Paul Revere in a sense that the British are coming. How imminent do you think this threat is? How real do you think this threat is? So the question was, um, comment question was, isn't there a way to separate out reproductive rights from religious freedom so that we have two separate issues because I'm assuming that's because you know maybe we all don't agree on all of the same issues that can be said for every single policy area that this touches they have done an extremely good job they've done a fantastic job of making sure that those issues are intertwined right and we're going to see a lot of this play out in public education because everything is going to, almost everything is going to touch public education. Um, and we're going to see a lot of this play out in healthcare, right? Just generally. Those are the two areas that they have really, really been successful at intertwining. And the thread that goes through everything is that Christian nationalism. Now, to your question about, the second part of that question is, is this an, it sounds like you're saying this is an imminent threat. Sounds like you're saying that, uh, you know, maybe you're Paul Revere, right? You're asking, like, is this a situation where Paul Revere is riding through the colonies and saying, hey, the British are coming? Well, I'm not talking about the British, and I don't have a horse. <laughs> but yeah. Would you get the point? No, yes. 100%. This is an imminent threat. But there is hope there is still hope and it's through your help it's through all of our help it's through all of us being vocal all of us voting one of mainstream's mottos is do more than vote and so that's something that i'm going to challenge you all here today to do when you leave here make sure you vote right but then do more than vote bring your friend along talk to your family friends anyone who will listen about these issues you know, give yourself the education that you need to feel comfortable talking about them. And when you don't, call um, organizations like Planned Parenthood, Great Plains, and Mainstream. 
and ask questions. Um, but yeah, it is an imminent threat, but we still have hope. We have 30 days? 30 days of hope. And that's what we need to ride on. Hope instead of a horse, right? That's what we need like to ride it. on. I think it's very strange that they try to say this is based on the tradition of our country when the way our country started was people coming over here to get away from religion being forced down the road. So there's a very strong tradition, the opposite of the message that they're trying to do. Yeah. Did everyone hear that? Oh, I'm sorry, Julia. To the back of the room, um, I was going to say, don't you think, uh, we think it's an imminent threat, but this is a process that has been going on probably since the 70s. Correct. And first, one of the first things was abortion. That became a political issue, and it just latched on. These groups have been very, these people have been studying this thing. They got some pretty skillful people, knowledgeable people. This stuff, while it's an imminent threat now because of where things have happened, especially in, in, on, the, on the national level, you know, the Supreme Court, but these things have been going on for decades, and they've been very good at it. It's not something that's just happened overnight. That's, yeah, the comment was this is, they've been planning and plotting this for decades, and it's not just. The project 2025 is not the starting point. It's just where we've gotten to so far. May I add to that, or were you still? She no. Said her hand up from the very <laughs> <laughs> Julia, may I just add something quickly to to uh, I want to piggyback on what Aaron said about the 30-year history of them working. Yes, they have been working very very well at this. They've been doing an amazing job of getting their infrastructure in place for the last 30 years. So yes, I do believe this is still an imminent threat. Their infrastructure is now in place. Now their plan can be enacted because they have the people, because they have the support at the different levels of government. And uh, one of our founders, our founding uh, chairman, Dr. Bob Manili, he said back 30, over 30 years ago uh, that it wasn't, what they were doing is they were getting stealth candidates into office. Well, they're not so much stealth anymore, but they're still getting into office. And so that's why it's incumbent upon us to do more than vote, to vote than do more than vote. Thank you, Julia. Okay, yeah. was it you, Stephanie, that said your hand up? Okay. <laughs> Stephanie, why don't you come up here to the front? You've earned that. <laughs> I'm just curious about, I haven't read enough about from Project 2025, but diversity issues within the white national, yes. uh, whether they're using any of the biblical old stuff about diversity issues and trying to eliminate some of the, some of the success we've had in trying to broaden the diversity. The question is, are they using biblical stuff to broaden, to remove some of the DEI, right? I, I, I don't know. I don't know if they're using biblical references. I, I, they are definitely wanting to get away with, away from the DEI pushes that we've, and gains that we have had, and, and push a white nationalist view, frame of view. Yeah, I think, and, and thank you for mentioning specifically white Christian nationalism, mm -hmm. because that is probably the most predominant uh, branch or movement out of Christian nationalism itself. Um, and just by saying white Christian nationalism, or we can go farther and saying white straight Christian nationalism, I think you get the idea of the types of policies um, and the type of world that they're looking for. Um, do they use biblical uh, passages? Are they using you know, uh, the Bible as a weapon? Yes. I don't think they have to use passages anymore. They don't have to say, point to a specific psalm or a specific you know, sentence that is attributed to Jesus. They don't have to do that anymore because they've already, they've already gotten to the communities and the people that they wanted to be introduced to, and so they don't have to. Bad faith. Mainstream brought Bad Faith, a documentary about white Christian nationalism, oh, nationalism and how it's risen over the past 30 years. We brought that uh, for uh, its 
the premiere screening here in Kansas. Terrifying movie. You all have to see it, though. Make sure you have a care plan, though, and make sure you watch it with somebody. But it is intriguing, it is fascinating, it is terrifying, all rolled into one. But it, they do an amazing job of detailing that rise of Christian nationalism and putting that infrastructure in place over the last 30 years, like buying church lists from pastors and then getting access to those parishioners or access to those community members. So um, Bad Faith documentary, it's screening everywhere. I have no stake in it, except that I believe that everyone should see it. I'll just note also, I noticed on Facebook the other day, somebody from high school put a biblical quote uh, to that to, to attack DEI, and I thought, I don't remember that. And it, it was quoted as Luke 81, and I thought, well, I really don't remember Luke 81 in my Bible. <laughs> so I, and it got, I was like, no, there is no Luke 81. So they just make stuff up, too, which we all know. <laughs> So you talked about how Project 2025 wants to get rid of the uh, Department of Education and uh, public schools. Uh, what does that do about uh, colleges and universities? Do they want all colleges to be privatized or how will that will affect when my daughter goes to college? Sure, so that, that goes from K, I was speaking primarily of K, K, uh, K-12, K through 12. Um, but no, it definitely does reach up to universities and colleges. And so public funding of, because our state colleges, our state universities do have a public, f large component of, the, uh, of their operating budget is public funding. And that would be diverted as well. Denise? Um, and it's at that level that uh, the, the, what they want to get rid of is the U.S. Department of Education and we are um, state run by our K-12 systems. And one of the pieces that I see that could be extremely detrimental at the post-secondary level is federal financial aid is run out of the federal department. And there's a vast majority of students that attend post-secondary institutions have a lot of support with federal financial aid. Um, the other piece that the federal department does is they're the accrediting bodies, they, they support those for post-secondary accreditation. Our K-12 systems are state accredited. Um, and so it's that piece by eliminating the U.S. Department of Education, the intent is that maybe those duties would come to your, at your state level, and we don't fund the state level to do the job, let alone then you want to put, put post-secondary at that same level, it, it would be um, catastrophic. Thank you. Thank you for, for mentioning that. And for anyone who didn't catch the question, because I didn't repeat it, is the education, the negative impacts on education, is that just K through 12, or does it go to post-secondary? And so that was the basis of both of our answers. And I would like to say, I do have a little stat here. It would increase payments, student loan payments, if we did away with the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, for 60,000 Kansans, I don't know if I said that earlier, 60,000 Kansans, um, and it would replace... Uh, any income-driven repayment plan with one-size-fits-all from the federal government, and that would um, increase payments 2700 uh, $2, to $4,100 annually for those 60,000 uh, Kansans. We're about out of time. We've got a couple more questions. Paula, did you, and then, sir? I just wanted to make one additional comment with education. If you know anyone who has an IEP, a five, you know, a 504 plan, so if you have a special needs student, a gifted student, a student that has any sort of learning challenge, forget about them getting any services. <coughs> Think about your grandkids, your own children. Those things are going to cease to exist if there's no federal department of education. Right, and then and special, you know, special ed funding is, we, we don't fund special ed. Yeah, we already struggle. We already struggle with that in Kansas. My sister is a special ed uh, early childhood development teacher in Kansas City, Kansas, and they have no funding. They cannot keep up with their needs. Um, so we already face that problem, and it would be 10 times worse. These programs would be non-existent. Right now, if someone uses a voucher, because we do have voucher programs in Kansas, and they go to a private school that does not have to have a special education department, guess where those, those children go? They go back to the public school for that special education, but the public school is not receiving any funds for that. 
So if that gives, if that's any kind of like precursor to what could happen, we just have to look at what's going on in Kansas right now. Last one. Okay, you've talked an awful lot about the uh, consequences in all of this, and you began by saying, "Oh, it is the uh, it is the wealthy folks uh, that uh, want all of this put into place." But 30, 37 percent of uh, uh, of the, only thirty seven percent of the population uh, over, uh, over over eighteen years of age. Uh, have education beyond uh, the high school level, number one. Number two, political science sociologist in Miroslav uh, Wolf at Yale, at Yale Divinity School has also pointed out that the biggest problem and the biggest supporters of white Christian, or forget the white, Christian nationalism and Project 2025, they've never read it, they don't understand it, but they support it because of fear. Yeah, now, this group all yeah. understands the, the consequences and the difficulties, and everybody has pointed out what are the difficulties. What do we need? Now, don't say vote. <laughs> what do we need to do to make, to make these, folks, these folks aware? Because the other thing is, the, the other factor in all of this is, again, according to most sociologists and, and political scientists, is fear on the part of the majority of the population who are working when they're having trouble just making ends meet or whatever, and this is an alternative to go back to the church. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> Did everyone hear that? Because I don't think I could repeat the entire thing. That, that, that's a big question. That's a huge question. <laughs> I will say you're not going to like, okay, first of all, if anyone needs to leave, please do. You will not be rude and completely understand that the 11 o'clock is happening in just two minutes. Um, and so we're not going to answer that entire question in two minutes, but I do want to say you're not going to like the first part. Vote. <laughs> I do. I want to. I want to jump in because I know you don't want to hear vote. But we do have to. Okay. <laughs> we do have to figure out a way to talk to those folks because you're right. It's they fear that they are going to lose what they have, and they don't understand that they are benefiting by the current administration. They've benefited more by this administration than the last administration. And the other side has done a great job through their news channels and through social media of getting their message to those folks. And so. I think there has to be a counter a counter attack, counterbalance to get to talking to those folks and figuring out how to communicate with them and getting getting there's like a fever fever dream on our country right now and how do we break through that? And I don't have that answer, but maybe Michael does and maybe he's gonna say it's a vote. I don't know. So I do have that answer. I just haven't shared it with the rest of the United States yet. You're the first to hear this. Well, no, I, I, maybe. Maybe I have a piece of that, right? Yes, vote. Yes, do more than vote. Get other people to vote. Educate yourselves. I'm gay. It's incumbent upon me. Unfortunately, it's always incumbent upon the um, like minority community um, or whomever to talk about and educate, right? To educate other people. I've seen in my life, in personal experience, more hearts and minds being turned through personal connections than through facts and figures, right? So we have to remember, this is not about facts and figures because there's cognitive, cognitive dissonance happening. People who are adherents to uh, Christian uh, nationalism, to Project 2025, they've, show, they've done studies, they've shown this on TV anecdotally, they could read everything how they, they could read all the different ways they've benefited, right? Um, under the current democracy that we have. But they, and maybe for a minute or for a second, you see something click, but then they go right back. Do you know why? It's because it's very hard to give up something that you believe, right? If someone came in here today and said, y'all should be Jewish, here are the reasons why. Right, and nothing against Jewish people, right? Different religion. Um, what would you say? No. Right? Because you believe. We believe. Right? It's very hard to move someone, especially if that someone has believed something for 
70 years, 60 years, 30 years. So it's personal conversations, folks. It's, it's educating ourselves on the issues, educating ourselves on the consequences, and then speaking with people, having conversations with people that we know so that hopefully we can move the needle. It's the power, you know, it's the power of numbers, right? The more people you talk to, the more people they talk to. And then hopefully that's how we, as a community, can have grassroots change. So that's long term, but getting back to the why the urgency now, there is one, I know we can't be partisan, but there is one vice presidential candidate who has been part of Project 2025, yeah. although he's is very, very reluctant to admit or talk about it yeah. and avoids it all the time. And they're counting on uh, one of the presidential candidates to be very amenable to manipulation and therefore this election could foster more uh, of the project's culmination. One minute before we thank our panel. In Thursday's EMI, Church and Society made, put out an announcement that there is going to be a webinar this Thursday, October the 10th, from noon to one o'clock, Faith in Democracy. This is a webinar that is designed to help us talk to our neighbors, our friends, our family, whoever will listen to us about getting educated. Do you really know what you're voting for? We're not, it's not advocating policy. It's not advocating a candidate. It is advocating this is how you talk to people. So go back to Eli on Thursday. There's a link there that you can register for that webinar. Even if you can't attend that from 12 to 1, if you're registered, you will automatically receive the recording. So I strongly urge you to uh, go back and take a look at that and, and um, what What's and the register. website again? Well, it's on our ELI. It's oh, on as, visit asbury.org, okay. and there's a, an announcement about this Faith and Democracy webinar. It's in it's today's also bulletin. What? It's in, in the bulletin. Today's bulletin. Oh, it's, okay, I haven't seen today's bulletin yet. Okay. Aaron, Michael, thanks a million. They've been amazing. I thank all of you. I did forget to mention, there's information back there on that table from Mainstream. Um, we do have a QR code and website that you can go to that will be up tomorrow at some point that'll have a bunch of the stuff that we talked about today, more than you ever wanted to know probably. And then what you can do immediately for voting.